Romans chapter 8, and if you recall last week, we were finishing off at verse 9, verse 9, and we were going over uh, the carnal mind, the carnal mind. Now we're seeing here in verse 10, give me an amen when you're there, by the way. Romans 8, verse 10, verse 10, and I'll give you a second. Romans chapter 8, verse 10, the, uh, the scripture says here, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, again, we see here and all throughout the book of Romans a reference to the, the two natures of man, of a saved Christian. The fact that he has a carnal, lost nature, which is his body, his body, his flesh, his carnal nature, and then his uh, spiritual nature, which he's given by God when he is born again, and he's regenerated. All right, so here in verse 9, it says, I'm sorry, verse 10, and if Christ be in you. Now remember, you are in Christ, but Christ is also inside of you. Ain't that something? And the Holy Spirit is inside of you, right? Remember, Jesus Christ is God. The Holy Spirit is God. God the Father is God. All right, so it doesn't, it's not a big deal to, to uh, it's not a big deal when we throw out these things that just are confusing because listen he's god he's inside of you he's he's with you every step along the way and if christ be in you the body is dead because of sin you see you have a dead body sure it might have a heartbeat you might have a pulse you might breathe in you might breathe out you might have blood flowing through your body but spiritually on a spiritual level your, your body is dead it's lost Adam and Eve, uh, they sinned in the garden, and guess what? You are a direct descendant from Adam, and you are directly from his seed, Adam's seed. So Christ is in you, but you also have a spiritual, bo a dead body that is because of sin. But don't worry, because the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, whose righteousness would that be? Jesus Christ. Your own personal righteousness could never save your soul from an eternal burning hell. Your own personal righteousness could not save you. That's why someone who actually was righteous had to live and die a perfect, sinless death that was uh, in your place. In your place. Now, as we go on to verse 10, uh, verse 11, it says here, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Now, what happened to Jesus Christ when he died? He was buried, and guess what? He rose again. Now, by what power was he risen from the dead? Well, it tells you right here. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus, he was raised up from the dead by the spirit of God. Now, what do you get when you get saved? You get the spirit of God. So you have the spirit of God dwelling inside of you dwelling inside of you, and that power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead, that power you have access to. We're always talking about uh, uh, fulfillment and power and finding the power that's inside of you, and we see all these movies about the power inside and the strength from inside, and, and it, all these worldly movies, they're onto something, but they don't want to admit the fact that that power can only come from the Lord Jesus Christ, His Spirit. That Verse 11, but of the spirit of him that raised up. By the way, notice how him is not capitalized. What's that mean? Does that mean it's not God? No. You need to realize something. When the Bible, the King James Bible was translated, the authors never claimed that they would capitalize every reference to God. They never claimed that. And it's wrong, it's intellectually dishonest for us to assume that every verse that has to do with God and every reference that has to do with God, it's intellectually dishonest for us to assume that that always has to be the case. Sometimes there's verses and there's words that are referencing God that aren't always capitalized. They never promised that. So it's wrong for us to just assume that that's always going to be the case. We can. There's nothing wrong with us. I mean, we, I, and I've seen some people that, make, that nitpick and like, oh, you didn't capitalize God in that sentence. You're so carnal. <laughs> I remember, and brother, I'm going to throw you under the bus. I'm sorry. I remember when I first started going to church 
and I was uh, doing, we had an institute. We had our, like, I, we would do an institute, and we'd put in our tests, and we'd, and Brother Lewis, you graded most of them, didn't you? And Brother Lewis, that red pen that he had, or whatever thing he marked my grades with, he would nitpick every single sentence. Oh, you didn't capitalize this, or you didn't do this, or that, or that. I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> but the, cap the translators never promised they'd capitalize every reference to God. So don't assume that just because it doesn't have a, a capital H in there that it's not talking about God. All right, so going back to the verse, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. All right, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, the Holy Spirit, you're his temple, correct? It means you're, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. I'm sorry. Uh, that, was ver that was verse 9 from last week. I'm sorry. Verse 11, verse 11. Uh, he that raised Christ up from the dead shall also quicken. Who knows what that word quicken means? It doesn't mean made fast. It doesn't mean well, you're really fast on your feet. It means to be made alive. Uh, Ephesians 2.1, we can cross-reference that. By the way, this is a verse you should have highlighted in your Bible. Ephesians 2.1, if you can, turn with me. If not, just keep, keep your book, uh, your hand in Romans 8. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. God quickened you. That means he made you alive when you were dead. Okay, now again... When you're made alive in Christ, it didn't mean you didn't have a free will before Jesus Christ. All right, there's a, there's a Calvinist doctrine. Uh, they believe that you're so totally depraved and dead in your sin that you can never choose to get saved. God has to force you to choose. That's not the case. We don't have a dead will. All right, in the Old Testament, before anyone was ever even born again, a person that was to give sacrifice to God, they also had the option of a free will sacrifice. They had a free will even though they weren't indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. By the way, I'm going, to do a, I'm going to do something for you folks on Calvinism pretty soon. I think maybe maybe next week. It'll be fun. All right. It's fun. It's fun making fun of Calvinists. <laughs> all right. So we're going to make it a party. Amen. No, I'm just kidding. Um, all right. Go, go back to verse 11. Now, you have the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. His Holy Spirit is dwelling inside of you. And, you, and Jesus Christ was raised up from the dead. And guess what? You have that same power, so you will be raised up from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 49 to 54. We were here last week, but I'll read it again. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, uh, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. God gave you that power. I mean, amen, man. I, I love knowing that we have access to that, that awesome power to raise from the dead. All right, let's do another one. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19, verses 19 to 20. Ephesians 1, 19 to 20 says this, And what is the exceeding power, or greatness of his power to us, word, who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places? See, that power that we get from God is the power that gave Jesus Christ, that throne on the right hand of God. And we have that. So where Jesus went in heavenly places, your soul is seated there too. So always remember that. Always remember that that power is inside of you. Because sometimes you can feel so uh, just normal, just bland. Like there's, you know, you're going through these problems and it's just the same old thing saying, well, hey, you got the power of God inside of you. You know, you're, you're not just some boring old creature. You're not like the animals that are just, they are what they are. You have something so great inside of you that it had the power to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. And one day it's going to raise you into an incorruptible body. Well, all right, so let's continue further. Continue further. Um, okay. I just don't want to get ahead of myself because we're going somewhere with this. All right, verse 12. Verse 12. 
Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. All right? We are debtors. What does that mean? We owe something not to the flesh to live after the flesh. So we don't owe anything to our flesh. Now, there's verses in the Bible that sometimes you have to think about. That, that's a verse that, right off the bat, it doesn't really make sense to me. But when you think about it further and further, it, it starts to make a whole lot of sense. What do you mean? We don't owe anything to our flesh. Your flesh will try and panhandle you and beg you for scraps and beg you to feed it and beg you like, a, like it's homeless, like it's begging for something that, that listen, you don't owe that flesh anything. Um, I'm going to have a practical example. Now, this is just me. I have a problem with giving uh, people, beggars stuff. Like, I'll, I'll give them something when I can't even afford a meal for myself. And you don't owe that person anything. Listen, I know it's nice. I know it's kind to give. But before you give to that person, you better make sure, can I afford it? Can I afford to give something to someone else before you're even tithing to your church? You know, the church comes first before you go and, and, and do charity cases for all these other people. Why? Because the church is the, is, the, is the funnel through which God does all these things. So before you go ahead and give to these other people that are begging and they, they're asking for uh, free handouts here and there, why don't you make sure the church is taken care of first? Your family's taken care of first. Your needs are met first. Because if you're better off uh, later, you'll be in a better position to support other people when you can afford to. See, because otherwise, you're trying to uh, make something for yourself, but you keep giving all your goods away, and you'll never be able to support yourself financially and get yourself to a better position. So it's better in the long run if you hold off on that charity and just focus on what you can to make yourself in a better position later. See, and that goes against our common sense, like, oh, but I just want to give. I love helping the poor. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that. There's something wrong with it when you when you can't feed your kids and you gave someone some of your food to a homeless person instead. See, that, that's a that's an imbalance of priorities. There's something wrong with with it when you, when you're tithing like five bucks a week and you gave that homeless person twenty bucks. It happens. It happens. See, and what am I getting at? Your flesh will continue to ask and ask for checks that you can't cash. Your flesh will continue to panhandle. I met, a, I, I met a woman before. I helped her out, and I gave her a lot of, mo- a, a lot of money because she was begging. She, I felt really bad for her. And what I found out, now I'm the guy she calls anytime she's going through something. Anytime. Oh, Angel, I can't pay my rent. Oh, I can't pay. They're going to turn off my power. Oh, they're going can't, to. I can't have my food here because the fridge is going to die. And it's a sob story every time. Every time. And your flesh will begin to, right, your flesh will begin to just, oh, but you go to church every week, brother. Listen, you do all these things and what, just a little bit. Just remember the good old days? Remember when you helped me out that one time? And your flesh will just begin to ask you to write checks you can't cash. You don't owe that flesh anything. You don't owe it anything. Let it suffer. Let it starve. Let it die out. Let it suffer alone. Because guess what? Your flesh will only begin to come back for more. And if you do it once, it'll be way easier the next time. Okay, here's a little bit more cash. Oh, here's a little bit more. Happens to us all the time. Happens to me. Don't do it. You don't owe that flesh anything. And all that from just one verse. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. See, at face value, that verse doesn't mean much. But if you get into it, that's the word of God. All right, let's move, fo- let's move forward. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if through the uh, Spirit do mortify the deeds of the, uh, of the body, ye shall live. Okay, so let's do something here. Now, what's that mean? See, because this is a verse that you can use out of context to make it sound like you, Christians, can lose your salvation. Why? Let's read it again. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. I'm going to go to hell if I live after the flesh? If I backslide? If I get out of the faith? If I fall away? No. It just says you'll die. Let's go to Galatians 6, 8. What verse was that again? I was in verse 12. 
verse 13. 13. Galatians 6, 7 to 8. Let's do 7 to 8. Brother Orlando, can you read that for the church, please? Do not be deceived, God is not mine, for whatsoever a man soweth, thus shall he also reap. For he, hath, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap the life everlasting. So if you sow in your spirit... If you sow in your flesh, you will reap corruption. What's that mean? Is that, is that, re, is that regarding your eternal destiny? It's, 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 take it as it says. In your flesh, your body, your physical body. Let, let's do some common sense exercises here. If I smoke a cigar every night for 30 years and I get cancer, does that mean I lose my salvation? No. no. Does that mean my body's going to die? If I make these carnal decisions every day and I sow into my flesh and give it what it wants, what's going to happen naturally? I'll die. All right? What happens if you, if you go around with too many uh, partners, sexual partners? Guess what? You're going to get some sort of disease and that'll lead to death. What happens if you go to all these bars and drink all night and smoke all night? Guess what? You'll probably get liver disease. Uh, what happens? Listen. Why is it that all the shootings that happen outside of the school shootings, why is it that they're always at bars, festivals, concerts, places where Christians have no, they, they got no reason to be? Why is it that the natural result of all these sinful activities always leads to death? Sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping. So Galatians 5, 24 to 25. Brother Jesse, can you read that for us, please? 2425, please. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. What's that mean? That's a conditional clause. Let, uh, if we live in the Spirit, let us. You know, when you ask let us, it's asking permission. Permission. It's not, uh, if you live in the Spirit, you will, if you will walk in the Spirit. No, it's up to you if you want to walk and abide by these spiritual rules or spiritual laws. And let's move forward because I want to explain to you a very important heresy. A very important heresy. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, I want to explain to you something that I've done before. But there is a heretical doctrine known as lordship salvation. What's that mean? That means if you continue in sin, if, if you continue in sin, you're not really saved. There's another cute way of saying it. If he's not Lord of all, he ain't Lord of all, Lord at all. If he's not Lord of everything in your life, he's not Lord of anything in your life. Why? Because you don't let him, uh, you haven't given over the sin of smoking, of fornicating. You haven't given over the sin of cussing. And you know what's funny about this, this heresy is that they can never define in clear terms what sins are damnable or what sins are just acceptable. See, because they say, if you continue in your sins, if you continue, uh, I, meant, I messed that up. <laughs> if you continue in, let me rewrite that. Thanks, guys. If you continue in your sins, you're not really saved at all. That's what they'll say. And they got verses to prove it. I mean, you can prove any heresy if you, if you really dig deep enough. But is this really true? Well, let's compare it with the Bible. Lordship salvation teaches that if you are a really saved Christian, you will, one, bear some fruit. That's what they say. Now, what kind of fruit? They can never tell you. It always has to be, well, just something. How do you know? Sometimes fruit in your life isn't always visible to the outside observer. 
There should be something in your life that, that exhibits the fact that Jesus Christ saved you. The problem is when you start to say, I have to be able to see it. See, because now it's no longer God that defines whether you're saved or not. It's man. You deep down know whether you're saved or not. I don't have to see it. I don't have... Listen, that thief on the cross, he had no time to bear fruit. He was on that cross. He got saved and he died. We don't look at the outward and assume inwardly you're saved. Okay? Now, I have, I have reason to believe every, every person in this room is saved. I'm not denying that. What I'm getting at is the, the assumption that you need to show fruit in your life and you need to continue in your life and, and continue to fight sin in order to be saved. And if you, were never, if you didn't do that, then you were never saved to begin with. What does that mean? That means you can have... That means you have no eternal security. Lordship salvation offers no eternal security. Why? Because you have to persevere until the end to know if you were really saved to begin with. That's preservation of the saints. Or persevere, that's perseverance of the saints. That's Calvinism. That's the, that's, that's the last point in Tulip. Perseverance of the saints. And how do you know if you're really saved until you die? A Calvinist or a Lordship salvationist doesn't. I know when I got saved... The Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know you have eternal life. Amen. I can know I'm saved. I can know I'm going to heaven, and I can know I'm eternally secure because Romans 8, 38 to 39 tells me. By the way, it tells you here in verse, uh, let me find it for you. Is it first, first? Yes, verse 16, which we'll be reading shortly. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So the Holy Spirit bore witness to you being saved when you got saved. And it doesn't matter what other people say. The Holy Spirit bore witness to it. You are eternally secure. You're a son of God. Lordship, Lordship salvation is a workaround because there's verses in the Bible that make it seem like a person can lose their salvation. So what they'll say, because they want to always, they still believe salvation by grace through faith, what they have to say to get around verses where the Bible is clear that a person can lose their salvation, which is in the Old Testament and the tribulation, they have to make a workaround by saying, no, that person in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, when they go to hell, they were never really saved to begin with. Because they have to say every, Christ, every person at every dispensation has always been saved by grace through faith, alone, without works. See, so because they refuse to just take the verses in the Old Testament and the, in Revelation as it says, where it's, it's very obvious that a person can lose their salvation, because they refuse to rightly divide that and they assume salvation's always been the same, they have to figure out a way to make it reconcile the two. And that way is lordship salvation. Because otherwise, it, their whole thing doesn't make sense. It has to be, this has to be in place. And the problem with that now is now they have no eternal security because they have to continue in good works to, to prove that they were really saved. And if they fall away, if they reject Jesus Christ, if they, uh, if they just fall into deep sin and they, and they backslide, guess what? Oh, they were never really saved to begin with. Says who? Says your stupid little doctrine? No, I believe the Bible. I believe what the Bible has to say about eternal security. I believe what the Bible has to say about that there's no other creature that can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I feel like there's one more thing I have to bring up regarding this doctrine. You live after the flesh, you shall die. Verse, mortify the deeds of the body. Therefore, brethren, to live after the flesh. Um, verse 14, you have the sons of God. Look, they'll use this verse, verse 14. They, they use this verse, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So they use that verse to say, look, if you're really led by God, uh, you're going to do all these good works. No, that verse is talking about if you're led to God, you'll be led to heaven. It has nothing to do with your walk. It has nothing to do, you still have to, you still have to walk. It has no bearing on your eternal security. All right, verse 15. Verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. 
Now, this is one of the doctrines of salvation that we've gone over in the past, but when you were born again, you were adopted into the family of God. Remember the first time, Ephesians chapter 2, that you were in the spiritual family of the devil. When you got born again, you were then adopted into the body of Christ, and you became a spiritual son of God. Now, you have that relationship with God whereby you cry, Abba, Father. Now, that word Abba is a... It, it, it is a very intimate term. It's, it's like Papa. It's not just, uh, hey, Dad. What's up, Dad? What's up, daddy -o? No. Abba, it's like calling him your daddy, calling him your Papa. It's a very uh, intimate and dear term whereby we call God our Father. Yes? The worship salvation Yes. Now, that's a general term. Now, this is a doctrine. This isn't a group of people necessarily. Uh, uh, there's many different denominations that believe that, however. In fact, most of them. A Presbyterian, Calvinist, uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, what, are they, what are they called? There is revised dispensationalists. They adhere to that. And it's not one of those things where like, oh, they believe that, they believe in works for salvation, they're damned. No, I believe a lot of them are sincerely saved. But it just so happens because they don't write, believe in uh, every word as it says, they have to use this as a workaround for their doctrine. Otherwise, it, their, their whole system falls apart. We don't have to do that. See? And I'll get into this when I talk about Calvinism next week, hopefully. Do, but I want to use this as a, as a space right now. Is everyone on the same page? Are you guys following me? Is there any questions? Yes. And I'll get into that next week. Uh, as far as I know, it's just Abba, A-B-B-A, -B -B -A, Abba. You, you, you can remember it easily because of that heretical, wicked band, Abba. You sounded nervous there. You like Abba? I <laughs> No! <laughs> anyway, let's move forward. All right. So for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You don't have that spirit of bondage. You know, every lost person has an internalized fear of being judged one day. And what they'll do is they'll distract themselves day after day and hide from the truth and ignore it and ignore it until either one, they get right, or two, they go to hell. Every person. And one day, judgment's going to come. And that great white throne judgment, all those things they wanted to avoid, they wanted to stop thinking about, it'll come to pass, and they could have avoided it. They, wouldn't have, they didn't have to go, and they're going to have to be judged as a lost sinner. All right, final verse here for the night. Verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, first and foremost, this, this verse is a point of contention for a lot of Bible correctors. And they're going to look at your Bible, your King James, perfect Word of God Bible, and they're going to say, look, the, your Bible has God as an it. Oh, 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 debunked. All right, King James onlyism. It's, her, it's heresy. Now, let's, let's, let's analyze it real quick. Okay. So first thing, they change that word itself into mo in modern Bibles. Now... What you need to realize about the word spirit here, spirit is not a gendered term. It's not a gendered word. Spirit, it doesn't signify male or female. Okay? In the Greek, which, let me sound fancy real quick. In the Greek, did you know that pneuma, the Greek word for spirits, is a neuter word? But for you lay folks, you laymen, neuter simply means without male or female. Neuter is simply a word that doesn't have gender behind it. That word spirit is a neuter word. So when it says itself, it's not necessarily, it, it doesn't have to be uh, gendered. But another thing you need to realize is that word itself is not referencing the Holy Spirit of God per se, but the work of the Spirit of God. You see, throughout this entire first half of the chapter, we've been seeing God's Spirit working, all right? 
a spirit bore witness. That's a work by the Holy Spirit of God. All right. Uh, we have that spiritual mind, that spiritual mind. Uh, that's verse one to two. We see, therefore, there is now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, after the spirit. See, when we are in the spirit, we are not in condemnation. Okay. That's a work of the spirit. Verse 5, we see here, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. That's a work of the Spirit. The fact that we can have spiritual understanding and understand spiritual things is, is not because we're so smart. You can't be, you, you'll never be smart enough to understand spiritual things. You can have an IQ of 300. The Spirit has to be the, re, the, the way you get access to that. It's a work of the Spirit. Now, verse 10 Verse 10, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. You have life because of the spirit. These are all works of the spirit we're reading. Now, let's look at that in context. Verse 16, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So I want to go over four things, and this is straight from TBDI. I like to give credit where credit is due. All right, this is where your tithe offerings are going to. Amen. Amen. Uh, verse, uh, first thing, the, the, uh, four things about the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, number one, it will testify as to the person of Jesus. It will testify as to Jesus, the person of Jesus. And we're going to go to 1 John, 1 John 4, verses 1 to 3. 1 John 4, verses 1 to 3. Okay, almost there. 1 John, 1 John, not the book of John, but 1 John. Verses 1 to 3. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits where, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the, that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and now, even now already is it in the world. Now, we know Christ's spirit because it will testify to the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord, is God. We know that those Jehovah's Witnesses are not of God. They are of the devil because why? They reject the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't believe in Jesus Christ being really being God. Uh, that's, the, the Spirit is the one testifying to that. See? Because if they were saying, oh, Jesus isn't God, you automatically you know that's not of God. Verse 1 is telling you, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. How do you try them? Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Oh, no! I believe he's a created God. Mormons. All right. Hey, that was easy. Spirit of discernment. I know that that's not of God. The Bible tells me so. The Spirit bore witness to that, testified against them, and testified to the person of Jesus Christ being the Son of God and being God. All right, number two. It testifies, the Holy Spirit testifies to the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Keep your hand in First uh, John. Testifies to the work of Jesus on our behalf. I need a bigger whiteboard. <laughs> yeah, please, brother. <laughs> First John chapter 4, verses 10 to 15. First John, Orlando, can you read that for us, brother? 10 to 15. First John 10 to 15. Seen and, and 
Jesus testified that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Amen. I want to go back up here real quick. Verse 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in him. This is how we know that we're saved. How do we know? And he in us, because he hath given us his spirit. All right? Jesus Christ died for our sins, and he put up our sins on himself on the cross. And we know we're saved. Why? Because he gave us his spirit. And we have seen him and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. That's another verse against Calvinists, by the way. Verse 15, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. Right? So it testifies to the work of Jesus on our behalf. See, we have received Jesus Christ through salvation by believing on him, and the Holy Spirit is how we know that. It's how we know that. And uh, next thing I want to take you to is it testifies to the presence of Jesus. To the presence of Jesus and I think that's still in 1 John. Uh, turn with me now, if you can. 1 John 5, verses 9 to 12. 1 John 5, 9 to 12. The Bible says here in 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 to 12, uh, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God. All right, pay attention which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believed not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is a record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. All right? And I'll, I'll finish it off with here, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So, again, we have access to that. We can know we're saved. We have assurance of salvation. And we can testify to the presence of Jesus in our life uh, through the Spirit of God. Why? How? Because we believed on the Son of God. All right, verse 14. 11 to 13, let's read this again. 1 John 5, it witnesses in conjunction with the Scripture. It witnesses in conjunction, conjunction with the Scripture. To the presence of Jesus Christ. Now, it witnesses, in con it witnesses in conjunction with the Scripture. Uh, verses 11 to 13. And this is the record that God hath given, a, given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Okay? What's the record? Read, read verse 12. By the way, this is a great verse to show someone who says the Bible is too hard to understand. This is a great verse to show someone. Look at how many syllables each word is. He that hath the Son hath life and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. What's this mean? All of these and thous? I don't get it. It's like gibberish to me. A four-year-old can get that. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. If you have Jesus Christ, you're, you're born again. If you don't, you're dead. It's that simple. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. See? Notice how it said in verse 11, this is the record. Hey, for the record, he that hath the Son of God hath, not li hath life, and he that not, hath not the Son of God hath not life. And he wrote these things to you so that you could know you have the Son of God. And this is all because of the Spirit. And this is a work of the Holy Spirit. So I hope that you can just understand, just the, sometimes the, soul, the Holy Spirit of God is the most mysterious of the bunch, of the, of the three, of the tripartite being of God. It's the most mysterious because, listen, uh, emphasis isn't placed on the Spirit of God. You know who places a lot of emphasis on that? Is the, uh, the uh, uh, what, what do you call it? Charismatics. It's all about the Spirit. Are you Spirit-filled, brother? 
Oh, we're filled with the Spirit here. Listen, we can speak in tongues all day. That doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is here. In fact, I know for a fact that that means it's not there. He's not there. See, it's, it's funny how these people that are harping on and, about, on and on about the Spirit place so much emphasis on it, and because of that, they, have, they don't have the Spirit. There's, the Spirit of God is here. So with that being said, I hope that this would have been a blessing to you.